Good morning, Mr. Ranga. Pleasure to host you on this fireside chat. As the name suggests, fireside, we'll keep it informal. Uh, I'm not going to ask any questions on market share, business growth, but I think the idea is to hear your personal stories. Um, so my first question is a very obvious one. Um, Cycle Agarbati is deeply rooted or intertwined in rituals, culture, traditions. Uh, how has the brand established a meaningful connection with today's consumer who might not be vetted so much in rituals or uh, culture? Is there any insight? Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to come and tell our side of the story. Now, as long as there is God, there will be Agarbati. So that I'm not worried about. <laughs> and uh, as long as the market keeps going up and down, people will continue to pray as well. Uh, my only uh, challenge would remain to tell people, when you're praying, please use my brand. <laughs> and, and, so, and the way we communicate with consumers has evolved over the years. Uh, but more and more, I look at it. It goes back to who we are as a brand, what we stand for, what we believe in, what is our purpose, and how do we connect with the same mindset of the consumer. So as far as the category is concerned, it's almost a 85% penetrated category. So almost every household in India uses Agarbati at one, at one point of time or the other. It's just how do we make sure that we are there at the top of mind for them to consume the product. Absolutely. Um, now coming back to what the theme for today is and with digital transformation and the technological advancement, uh, how is the brand established or adapted itself to today's changing landscape? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you look at the category per se, Agarbati as a product, you know, we kind of think that it is uh, not a significant part of our lives, but every day when a mother actually lights those two Agarbati sticks, she prays for the well-being of her children. Hopes of the nation are intertwined with the product. Uh, you know, you may be paying 50 paisa for the Agarbati stick, but it has to burn completely, it has to be very fragrant. If not, your prayers are not fulfilled. It's a very deep-rooted emotional uh, need that we're fulfilling as a product. Owing to which, uh, we had to rapidly adapt to changing times. We had to mechanize quite a few of our processes to ensure consistency in the product. So we started to look at um, methods of modernization as early as 1970 uh, on, the, on the supply chain side. And then on the market side as well, if you look at how the categories evolved over the years, from an unbranded, loose packaging product to a branded product. Now, I wouldn't want to say cycle uh, push the envelope in terms of branding, but when I joined the company in, uh, in, in the year 2000, our brand awareness level nationally was at 3%, today it's at 26%. And it has happened due to modernization, not just on the supply chain, but also how we communicate with the customer. Um, you know, from channel uh, perspective, we've gotten into Salesforce automation real-time. As a company, we have 2,000 sales representatives. We real-time uh, monitor their sales every day. We have uh, back-end AI uh, for sales forecasting. We are, we are on SAP. We just migrated to S4 HANA uh, on the cloud. So from a technology stack standpoint, we are right, right up there to sell Agarbatis every day. Um, on the consumer side, though, we still need to remain traditional yet bring in some level of modernization and that creative challenge continues day. Very interesting. Um, on that same note, uh, we've noticed that uh, Cycle has associated a lot with sports over the past couple of years and which is noteworthy um, and I'm sure it would have been in the right direction of contemporizing the brand or uh, you know scaling up or expansion um, you know what what has it contributed to towards the brand uh, any insight well i love playing sports I've been a sportsman throughout i may not look like one now but i still manage to play uh, quite a bit of sports every day uh, i believe uh, that uh, sports builds a lot of character and for us the whole foray into sports more so into cricket happened in 2004 when there was the india pakistan series that was happening on 10 sports and uh, the night before the tournament started, one of the major sponsors backed out because it was a multinational and they had to get their approval from Korea and the approval didn't come in time. And who else would a media agency and a news channel call but a family business who can take a call overnight. So they called us and said, tomorrow the tournament is starting, what do you want to do? And then, you know, being the typical uh, businessman that I am, I managed to get a good squeeze in and uh, we got on, on board on 10 sports. Uh, and with Sevak scored all these amazing runs, we got the property called Super 4s and Super 6s. 
And with that, our foray into cricket began. We also then created a property around the third umpire branding where we had a tagline that said, everyone has a reason to pray. And when there was an out or not out decision, you get the third umpire branding with cycle coming in. And, and that kind of elevated the brand to, to the next level where our communication became mainstream. And cricket in our nation uh, is a religion in itself. It's a great unifier. And I realized after that, uh, that cricket as a medium uh, will be there in India forever, just like our prayer and goddess. And, and so we continue to be consistently visible on cricket. But on the other side, we said we should also do uh, something for the society that we are part of in terms of sports. So as a brand, we started promoting sportsmen that came out of Mysore. That's the city we are across genre. You know, it could be roller skates, could be shooting, hockey, cricket, tennis, golf. So quite a few sports persons over the last 15 years we promoted from, from our city. We've given them that little bit of boost that they required to take the next step. So in terms of advertising, it's been cricket predominantly, a little bit of comedy. But supporting sports, uh, you know, we've been doing quite uh, significantly within the organization as well. Also, you know, in the community that we're part of. That's, uh, that's really wonderful and amazing connect with uh, the sports. And I think you got the bang for the buck in year one. And I think that's what kind of cascaded down. Um, again, related subject, but... Um, and I know you do a lot of work with the community and sustainability has been a growing concern with a lot of brands. Every brand wants to talk about it, do something interesting, etc. in that area. And we all know that the brands which stand for purpose, and as you rightly said, this is a brand which stands for hope, um, faith, um, and we all know that brands which uh, forge, uh, or brands with purpose forge a deeper connection with consumer. How has your leadership journey been in that approach for Cycle, where you are today? You are in a very good space in that area. So any journey inside course, there? No, I think all of this started uh, with my grandfather who started the business in 1948. Very, very disciplined man, believe in doing the right thing every single time with every single prayer. Um, had tremendous um, ethical values. Uh, I've given this example umpteen number of times. In the office, when he would drink a cup of tea, he would actually pay for it from his personal expense. He would not actually book it in the office expense. So that's the level of uh, commitment and uh, integrity he had. And that kind of followed through with the second generation of our business as well. Total transparency in what we do um, uh, in our businesses, ethical uh, uh, you know, business practices throughout. And when I joined the business in 2000, that was one of the biggest advantages that I had to scale our business to the next level. Uh, many of my competitors were actually sitting behind the cash register when I could actually focus on the market and building value and getting more uh, for our consumers. And through that, our journey began uh, in which we realized that you know, we are delivering hope to people day in and day out. And everybody is hoping for a better future for their children and for themselves. And what better way for us to help fulfill that promise uh, you know, rather than be more sustainable. So we, today, we are the only zero carbon incense manufacturer in the world. We have offset our entire plastic footprint this year and by 2024 uh, we would be completely uh, off plastic. Uh, offsetting our plastic footprint, we use a recyclable board in our packaging material. We have OSHA's occupational health and safety certifications across the board. So sustainability is something that we have kind of ingrained into the organization's culture and ethos. And um, this year going forward, we have also included that in the performance matrix of our senior management. Our sustainability is uh, part of their uh, performance indicators as well, uh, so that you know it kind of gets ingrained into everybody's DNA also. And I believe most organizations would wait for uh, a law to be passed to follow through that, but we believe we need to be ahead of that. And so uh, the market still does not see that as a distinct advantage, but I think it's a matter of time. As long as we keep communicating what we stand for and what we believe in, it's a matter of time that the market also starts appreciating that. In fact, that was my next question. A lot of time we buy a product, uh, or a brand and we, we are not aware of you know uh, the ethos or uh, this is a brand which I'm buying which is plastic free or reducing carbon uh, you know footprint um, and that's great and remarkable um, leading by action and not only you know in, inside board discussions um, another question which comes to my mind is um, amazing brand built over two decades plus experience in managing this any challenges which you want to highlight? You know, it's a legacy brand, comes with strong traditional values. 
um, and you've built on that and you've leveraged on that, right? And you still stayed relevant and you've innovated and I'm a personal fan of your um, Iris brand, which is into fragrances and personal candles. So any challenges uh, in the last two decades of your uh, leadership? No, I think uh, challenges are uh, umpteen. I think uh, more than uh, uh, challenges, I'd like to look at them as opportunities. So whenever we've come up with a challenge, it's, I, you know, it's, it's to the leader and the leadership team within to see how we can make that into an opportunity. That being said, I think the first opportunity came to us in uh, the year 2000, 2001, when all the multinationals came into India and wanted to enter the Agabati space. We had uh, right from Hindustan Liver to Godrej to Record Ben Kaiser and ITC and everybody who came in to this so-called relatively unorganized category. And that's when we realized that as a brand, we stand for two things. On one side, we're fulfilling people's emotional prayer need, and on the other side, we're also fulfilling a fragrance need. And that's when we created the brand Iris, which today is probably the leading home fragrance brand, uh, uh, you know, lifestyle home fragrance brand in the country. And we created functional hair care under a brand called Lea. I think the first biggest challenge I faced was in trying to create a, a mindset in our company, moving away from a a single product category uh, business to a multi-category business. You know, we never sold anything apart from Agarbati. Our ethos, the way we function, our supply chain, our, our front-end value chain, our distribution, all of that was aligned to selling a single product for almost 65 years. Moving that to multi-product marketing was a huge challenge for me. It was a big learning curve. Um, you know, almost It took us almost five, six years with the leadership team then you know, to build uh, what we did. The next biggest challenge I faced was to move in from a legacy system uh, of tally to a ERP system, which was real time. Uh, there was a huge cultural shift that we had to bring about within the organization, and, and that was an amazing journey. And the third, more humbling uh, experience was the whole e-commerce and uh, digital uh, endeavor that we went on. Uh, the last five years has been a rude awakening and a fantastic learning experience for me about how that entire monster is a completely different ball game altogether than what we do in the brick and mortar side of it. So that's been a big challenge that I'm still trying to overcome and, and I'm learning from it. Yeah, and I think you've done really well there because typically as customer we pick up anything which is, we, we go and buy fragrance, we have this, we, it needs to be sensorial and we need to smell and uh, just embarking on the e comm journey would have been tough, but uh, yes, today it's uh, and you are exporting as well to 75 plus countries. So I'm sure uh, something you've done right there. Yeah, exports uh, is relatively uh, a good story. Now, when India went through this whole transition of Ayurveda, spirituality, yoga, our product was an instant connect with the West. So you light an Agarbatti, immediately the Eastern ambience is created. You put one chanting uh, video and then uh, you're done, right? And in the West, and that's all they consider India to be more or less. So Agarbatti saw that wave and, you know, uh, for example, today Brazil is among the biggest markets and teenagers there find it cool to light Agarbatti, and Indian Agarbatti specifically. And so, so that's what we're seeing as a trend in the West. But in India, for me, I think uh, in the digital space, the revelation for me was I expected my existing marketing supply chain uh, team to actually embrace uh, digital commerce. It did not happen for the longest time. When I created that as an independent uh, SBU, created a different vertical, set up an independent team for it, that's when it started to flourish. And that was a rude awakening and um, you know, a lesson learned, I think. So whoever is here who are doing traditional marketing, I think you need to stop doing uh, digital, give it to the specialists who do digital and they'll do a lot better. The next biggest thing that I did is stop all my agencies. So I don't have any agency that I'm working with right now. I completely built the entire uh, creative team in-house, both for digital as well as offline. And I've seen tremendous results in that as well. I'm not saying agencies are bad. I moved out from a retainer model to a uh, project-based model where I'm getting a lot more for my buck as well. Like next, only thing left now is my media agency. That also I'm debating what to do. Thank next. God, you uh, <laughs> representing a media agency. I definitely don't want, <laughs> and I'm sure media agency is getting some, you know, uh, concrete and productive stuff on the no, table. Definitely, for I think media is something that you know, I'm still not able to wrap <laughs> my head around. So that I'm not going to touch for the near future. Yeah, also staying with the fragrance and the younger audience connect. I think overall. 
the sheer awareness uh, of fragrance around you and the people and the change which has happened that also would have added um, to building relevance to younger audience for sure. Uh, Create. what would be your message to all the young CMOs out there? Um, any leadership lesson or, you know, any personal advice or leave it to you? Uh, I mean, I'm not a, I mean, I have a long way to go still in my journey. I mean, it's inspirational to hear every story that, you know, uh, CEOs or leaders come and talk about it. Everything is a learning experience. So, I think for me, having an open mind is a fundamental requirement of anybody who wants to actually take a leadership position. Another thing I've realized is many a times, you know, when we are doing, when we are marketing, uh, we forget what the truth is actually and what we stand for. And I've seen many brands that, you know, uh, get so carried away with creative and marketing, they stop telling the truth. And that, that's something that we as leaders need to be very, very aware of. You know, what kind of culture are we building within the organization? Uh, it kind of seeps in very, very quickly. Um, so that's been one of the biggest lessons for me with the entire digital uh, revolution that's happening, uh, high level of data consumption. You know, we kind of take things for granted. You know, it's just an Instagram post. It will get consumed quickly and we'll move on to the next one. Uh, that mindset, I think, is a huge issue where we're, you know, reducing organization culture when people actually start seeing things that are not true. And, um, you know, consumer may fall for it once or twice, but eventually it will catch up. So. So that's something that I, I, I strongly believe in that, you know, as leaders, we need to take responsibility for. Sure, yeah, absolutely. You're staying authentic and I think Mr. Chaitanya talked about that customer can forget you once, twice, but if there is a problem and you don't take accountability, then of course you've lost that customer for in life. Um, that's great. Do we have time for uh, questions from the audience? Yes. Good morning. Thank you for the wonderful session. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, you spoke about the you know the others getting into the same for you. I'm a bit lover lover of agarbattis. You know, I don't repeat my agarbattis. So, um, ITC Mangaldeep has been really doing well. So, how do you see that? You know, in terms of the homegrown players doing it, it's a large space. And uh, what is the significance of cycling in your logo? Is something that I want to say. When you say doing well, I don't know what that means actually. They've yeah. come up with an app and now they're you know, they're really going strong on that. So the yeah, app is not other, but the app is yes, different, exactly. but yeah, I get what That's the way to reach the market and the customers. No, they've done a fabulous job with the app. Uh, they pushed half my team and built the app. So that was a wonderful thing they did. That being said, uh, that's what competition is all about. Uh, we do have an app as well, but we don't call it uh, brand. Our app is called Pure Prayer. Uh, where we do home pujas and all of that. We have another product called Soul Veda. So on the digital side, we have quite a few initiatives that we have done that are all running independently. What my father believed was that unless something becomes successful and is worthy of carrying the cycle logo on it, don't attach it to it. Right? So that's the reason why we don't communicate quite a few of the products that we have beyond just the Agavati brand. But it's a lesson learned, I think I need to start communicating that. Now why the word cycle? Um, Grandfather thought about it in the year 1950. He said, I need to create a logo and a symbol and a name that everybody in India will understand, immaterial of where they are from, what their cultural background is, and it needs to be something that unifies everyone. And the word cycle was so simple, everybody in India called a cycle a cycle. It was powered by your own will. You can go wherever you want with it. It's just like what God is to you. The philosophical value of what cycle means is that for everybody, a cycle is a cycle. No matter who you are in the social strata, God is the same. And so is the Agarbati, it's a cycle. So kind of unifies everything and that's why we came up with the word cycle in 1950. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, we only have question. time for that one question. Yeah, I, I, uh, uh, okay, I one think. last question. We can give it to the lady. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing about CSR activities? Since you use uh, sticks for uh, your Agarbati, uh, there will be a lot of trees being axed. So are you taking up any afforestation programs and your aromatic chemicals are make, uh, how do you reduce the carbon footprint? Yeah, like I said, we are the only zero carbon manufacturer. We completely offset our carbon footprint. We also follow the international standard called IFRA, International Fragrance Research Association. So we completely follow the IFRA guidelines. We also have an NABL certified lab where we do complete testing. And most importantly, my house, I use my agarbati every day. My wife and my child live in that. So. Apart from that, I think uh, about uh, uh, sticks that we use, we use bamboo sticks and we are one of the uh, 
industries that are, are encouraged by the forest department because bamboo is actually a grass that needs to be wild harvested. If you don't harvest the bamboo, it will encompass the, the entire forest. So uh, we do work with a lot of uh, forest departments in, in the Northeast as well as in Karnataka and Maharashtra, work on a lot of programs. We're trying to now do monoculture of bamboo through the forest department as well. Um, so quite a few initiatives we do on the social side as an organization. We've been running a school for blind girl children from the last uh, 40 years. We run a uh, skill development center for uh, women with disabilities. Quite a few of our initiatives are around uh, women empowerment. Rather, I'd like to say as an organization, we are empowered by women because 80% of our employees are women, uh, both at the, you know, right up to the managerial level, so. Awesome, on that. So the woman can ask you a question before you close. Can I? Is an opportunity? Yeah. Hi. So I'm Shalini from Lakshya Media, and uh, like me, there are a lot of people from agencies. And you made a very strong remark that you moved from agency to in-house into creatives, and you're finding try to find a way out from moving from media agencies to in-house. So you know, this is like the evening we have a lot of awards, and a lot of agencies are winning awards for their brands. So I would like to know what was the challenge that you're facing because we feel that we are partners in progress for our brands. So. What is the challenge that you faced with agencies? Yeah, like I said, on the creative side, right, um, I saw there was a huge churn within creative agencies. And I was, there was just no consistency at all. The planner would change, the, uh, my project uh, you know, in charge account manager would change, creative would keep changing. And uh, on the retainer, I would just keep giving and giving uh, for training the team in the creative agency. So rather than that, I said, let me work on a project basis, which is a start date, end date, clear deliverables with creative agencies. I get tremendous more value now. I do work today also. I call in whenever I have a new project to start on. I call for a brief, agency's brief. We pay a pitch fee, which most people don't. We pay a pitch fee as well. We select an agency and do a project. More or less, it's shooting an ad basically, right? So then the ad is done and then we move on. So there's no point of retainer. That's what I meant. So I'm off a retainer basis. Still work with quite a few creative agencies. And now I've seen I need more vernacular localized agencies. So I'm working with four different agencies. I have an agency in West Bengal now that's working on a project, agency in Delhi, I have an agency in Chennai, working with an agency in, in, in Mumbai now. So there's a different localized agencies, far more nimble, far more agile uh, that I'm getting tremendous value from. Media agencies again, I'm really looking at a lot of freelancers are available now who are really smart, uh, who are able to do uh, far better buying able to do far better analytics for me as well and negotiation. Channels are coming to me directly now and give me better deals also. So, you know, that whole uh, situation is also there. So I think just like every industry goes through a revolution, so as to speak, I think your agencies are also going through that and I'm sure you'll all fall, your, uh, fall in the right place. I think piece of the puzzle will fall in. Thank you so much for your candid feedback. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.